Greetings, everybody. I'd like to welcome everyone here, uh, future Dean Pubara of the Business School, and Elliot Engstrom from Civitas Institute. As I've spoken to uh, some of you in my classes, the lecture that you're going to hear today regards occupational licensure, which is a very important topic, especially for many of you who go out there and enter into businesses. For example, if you're an attorney, you need a license. If you're a doctor, you need a license. Also, if some of you decide to become a midwife, you're going to need a license. And we've been gracious today to have Elliot here come down as an expert on the subject matter to discuss what licensure means to everybody in this room and to businesses in North Carolina. So I'd like to welcome Elliot. Let's get a big round of applause. Go for it. Um, welcome, guys. This is co-hosted by this is hosted by the Lundy Chair of Business Philosophy and Free Enterprise. It's also co-hosted <laughs> by the Adam Smith Club and Young Americans for Liberty. We're glad to have you here as part of the Politics, Law, and Economics Lecture Series. This historic lecture series at Campbell University has gone over 32 plus years, um, and we're glad to host Elliot Engstrom, the staff attorney for Civitas Institute. Um, we've had him before. Elliot's a great guy, and you guys are going to really enjoy what you hear today. If I stand right here and talk loud, can you guys hear me in the back and everywhere? Okay, good. Um, I kind of I prefer to kind of move around a little bit. I'm a jittery guy when I talk. So thank you to everybody who made this talk happen. Uh, the Lundy Chair, the Adam Smith Club, Young Americans for Liberty. I always love coming down to Campbell. This is the second time I've been here. And uh, in fact, I have a Campbell student working for me right now named Jonathan Naylor, who, who some of you might have gone to school with him. He's at law school now, and he, he helps me out. Um, for our externships, we actually only take Campbell Law students. So it's, it's a really exciting partnership, and we, I love coming down. So we're going to talk about occupational licensure today. We're going to do a little bit of theory, just to give you the background. And you may, in your classes, have already covered some of it. And then we'll look at three real-world examples of how this impacts people so three court cases that have shown what licensure does, uh, how it affects the government, how it affects entrepreneurs, and hopefully you'll leave kind of seeing how this theory impacts real people. Because, uh, and like, a, like Professor Abby said, it likely will impact you if you go out into the business world one way or another. So licensure, it's a, it's a form of government regulation, and it, it's usually uh, organized under licensing boards. So the definition of a form of government regulation requiring a license to pursue a particular profession or vocation for compensation. And uh, the licensing boards, this, this is very important to understand, the licensing boards are made up of people in the profession. So the uh, locksmith licensing board is made up mostly of locksmiths. Uh, and the midwife licensing board is made up mostly of midwives. And this is different than a certifying board. So uh, the midwife licensing board decides whether you can be a midwife the American Translators Association, who certifies translators, decides whether you're a good translator. So it's a distinction. The licensure board is a government agency that allows you to work or not work. It's not somebody who gives you just a stamp of approval. And there are over 60 professions in North Carolina that require licenses. That's actually probably a conservative estimate, but I didn't want to go overboard. And uh, this is a, just a non-exhaustive list to give you an idea of the range. So um, things like veterinarian, that's not a surprise to anybody here, you go to veterinarian school. Attorneys, I'm very well aware that they make you take the bar exam to be an attorney and go to law school. Uh, cosmetologists, we're going to talk about cosmetology licenses. I, I got a haircut uh, yesterday and right on the table there's a certification that says North Carolina Cosmetology Board that allows you to do this. And it, it's a wide range of things um, and so just about anybody you know who says I am X for a living if it's a profession. There's likely a licensing board behind that. The, uh, in North Carolina, the average requirement is $180 in fees and 250 days of education. Now, question, and Garrett's going to answer questions for me today. He didn't know this yet, but uh, Garrett interned for me last summer. Do you think a barber or an emergency medical technician requires more complex licenses? And I know the fact that I'm asking the question probably gives away the answer. But, but in a rational, normal world where everything made sense, which one do you think it would be? EMT. EMT, right? Well, in North Carolina, a barber, it takes 10 times as long to become a barber to get the license in North Carolina that it does to become an EMT. Uh, the barber is actually 722 days of education. So 
somewhere around two years. I haven't crunched the numbers exactly. And uh, $120 in fees, whereas the EMT, 70 days and $0 in fees. Um, EMTs, you know, they work in ambulances, they save people's lives, barbers, they cut hair. Not, not, to, not to denigrate barbers, I couldn't do it. Uh, but it shows you that it's not necessarily as the job gets more complex, the licensing gets more complex. It's sort of all over the board. And uh, this is par for the course across um, a, lot of, a lot of industries. And uh, for the economic students in here, you know, I'm not an economist, so, so you, you guys are all out ahead of me. But a license is a barrier to entry, which means I keep going to the mic. Sorry. Uh, a license is a barrier to entry. So if, you're, if you already are a barber and you are cutting hair, and then there's someone who decides, I want to be a barber, well, if you already have the license, you can be making money the entire time that they are working to get their license, which is why it is a barrier to entry into the market. Um, even me, not an economist, I, I, can, I can get that part. Um, I'm sure there's some more complex things that I wouldn't understand about it. But uh, so as you can see, the barrier to entry to be an emergency medical technician is fairly low. Uh, you could today walk out of this school, assuming there was the you know, licensing period for the 70 days could start tomorrow. You could be an EMT in 70 days. You could be in an ambulance saving people's lives. Um, now, we're going to briefly go over the legal theory as it stands right now. So, th so that's licensing, just sort of the big picture of what it is. We're going to briefly go over the legal theory, how the courts treat this. And what that means is if I go to the court and I say, I shouldn't have to do that. I shouldn't have to get this license. I should be able to just go be a barber. Um, what happens? What do the courts do? And why do they do it? We're going to briefly go over that. Then we'll look at how this has happened, how this has affected real people. This is um, not something that you need to memorize at all. but. This is the structure of the law today. So these are called tiers of review. And what that means is that the, the government uses a certain tier of review to look at a given violation of rights. So if I go to the government and I say, my free speech is being violated. I wanted to speak out against a war. And the government told me I couldn't do that. Well, free speech is a protected right. And we see it falls under strict scrutiny. That means that the government has to show that the law that is restricting my speech serves a compelling governmental interest and is narrowly tailored to that interest. So in that situation, the government, it, it's an uphill battle for the government. If they want to restrict your freedom of speech, your uh, freedom of association, your freedom to vote, and sometimes your freedom of religion, the government has an uphill battle to fight in court. They have to show some compelling governmental interest and in it's in narrowly tailored. Um, it goes, as we go down the chart, it gets easier for the government to win. And economic liberties, like liberties that are you know, infringed upon by licensure laws, are right at the bottom of the barrel in terms of our constitutional law today. So if I go to the government and I say, I want to be a barber, and this licensing law is infringing on my liberty to be a barber, it is violating my due process rights, or it is treating me unequally as compared to other people, the government just has to show that the law serves a legitimate interest and that the law is rationally related to that interest. What that means is not that the government really has to go to a lot of trouble to meet this standard. What that means in layman's terms is that if the government has a law that is violating economic liberties or infringing upon economic liberties, they just have to be able to show some hypothetical situation, even if it has never happened, where their law makes sense. And we're going to look at a case where that happens. So, but so if I have a law that, uh, well, you know what, we'll go to the real world examples to see it. But the point, and this is likely the most important thing I will say today, if you don't remember anything else, the right now licensure laws for constitutional purposes are evaluated under the standard, under a standard where the government just has to show hypothetically in some situation that could happen, our law makes sense. That's the standard. So in that situation, very hard for the uh, entrepreneur or whoever is fighting the licensure law to win. Very, very hard uphill battle. Government almost always wins. So we're going to look at three case studies as to uh, people who have fought licensure laws and to see you know, how they do. Um, how did they fare? You know, how did the courts evaluate the claims? Um, we're going to start with Cindy Vong. Um, Cindy Vong lives in Arizona. She is a Vietnamese immigrant. She is very much alive and well today, as far as I know. And she runs a spa. Um, it's called La Vie. It's a spa out in Arizona. 
And so I, I, she is very near and dear to my heart because in law school, I clerked at a place called the Goldwater Institute out in Arizona. And this is one of the cases that we were working on with Cindy Ball. And she wanted to use these fish to clean feet, right? So uh, I don't watch Keeping Up with the Kardashians. You may be surprised, but, but my fiance loves Keeping Up with the Kardashians. And apparently the Kardashian girls go to the spa and have their feet treated by these fish, right? And it's these fish, they come and they nibble on your feet, they eat away dead skin, and I guess it exfoliates the skin and it just cleans your feet. Um, she never had a complaint lodged against her, ever, in the history of doing this, and her business boomed. She did great. Um, one extra little fact that I didn't include in the PowerPoint, in 2010 in the United Kingdom, a survey was done worldwide to try to find anyone who had ever been harmed as a result of this. Anybody who had ever gone in, gotten their feet nibbled by fish and lost their foot or something. They couldn't find one example anywhere, ever. So, Board of Cosmetology in Arizona did not approve. Uh, they sent her cease and desist letters and their rationale was an Arizona law that said if you're going to use an instrument to be, to, if you're going to use an instrument in a pedicure or a manicure, manicure or in any cosmetology, uh, that instrument has to be sterilized. Well, how do you sterilize a fish? I, I guess you burn it? I, I don't know. I mean, you can't sterilize a fish and still use it in cosmetology. Now, the rule obviously wasn't written with fish pedicures in mind. That being said, the Board of Cosmetology could have adopted a new rule, um, and Cindy Vong even offered to be the test case. She said, I will be the test case. You guys can promulgate new regulations. Um, well, this went to court in Arizona, and uh, remember that the government actor, the Arizona Board of Cosmetology, we had that chart up here, right? Bottom of the barrel, economic liberties. They have to put forth some hypothetical situation where it is dangerous. They couldn't find any examples, any examples anywhere of people being hurt by fish nibbling on feet. So they said, well, in theory, if you were to lean down, get a cup, scoop up the cup, scoop up the water with the fish in it, and drink it, you could get sick. Now, who in their right mind would do that? No one, right? No one would ever do that. But it's a hypothetical situation that could happen, right? Arizona courts ruled for the government. The Arizona Supreme Court wouldn't even hear the case. They said the law was so settled on this, she loses, end of day. Um, so what happened? was Cindy Wong appealed to the Supreme Court through a procedure where if the state courts don't remedy you, re remedy a violation of law against you, and you think your federal rights are being violated, you can go straight to the Supreme Court if they'll take your case. So we had the privilege of joining the Goldwater Institute and asking them, uh, will you take the case? And one thing I neglected to explain earlier is that uh, I work at the Center for Law and Freedom, which is the legal wing of Civitas, so it's CLF, that's why this is. And we said to the court um, that the case presents the court with the opportunity to clarify whether and to what extent courts may scrutinize the motivations of state actors when applying rational basis review. Remember that the Arizona Board of Cosmetology is made up of a bunch of cosmetologists who all compete with Cindy Vong. She is the only one that does this new fish pedicure and people loved it. Um, and if people are going to her for their pedicures, they're not going elsewhere for their pedicures. And we said to the court, you could clarify, is this, a, is this valid? C can they do this? We're going up against this. This is the case law as is in the Supreme Court. It is entirely irrelevant whether the conceived reason, the scooping up of the water, uh, for the challenge distinction actually motivated the legislature. And the legislature, in this case, means the Board of Cosmetology. So, Garrett, who wins? Who do you think wins? Yep. Government wins. Case is closed. Cindy Vong cannot use her fish. She is not allowed. And I realized I was speaking to undergraduate students today, so I don't know if you guys watch Seinfeld, but for those of you who do, um, he's the fish Nazi today. So Cindy Vong loses. As of today, if you, I, I don't know if any of you are going to get involved in the spa business, but if your state government tells you you can't use fish in your spa, tough luck. Uh, you can't. Even though there is you know, no examples of it hurting anyone ever, this is just, that's the state of the law. Um, and when I say the government wins, that means that the Supreme Court wouldn't even hear the case. They wouldn't even let the arguments be made. They said, nope, law is settled, she loses. So, that's Cindy Vong. She's not, yeah, I'm, actually her business hopefully still exists today, but um, by the way, she invested thousands and thousands of dollars in renovating her business to have this fish spa in it. And um, I guess that's a sunk cost now. Uh, that, that's just kind of 
the way it is. So we're going to come to North Carolina now. Uh, some of you may have heard about this case. This decision came out earlier this year. This was not an economic licensure case, but it involved a licensure board. And I think it shows you a little bit closer to home what's happening. So have you guys ever seen these in the mall? Uh, you, you go in the mall and you have these vendors that have these lights and they shine on your teeth. And I guess if you sit there for a long time, you know, grimacing, they'll whiten your teeth, right? Well, these people who, who do these whitening treatments, they're not dentists, they're just small business owners who they just own the light. They don't diagnose cavities, they don't do any of that, they just do the teeth whitening with the lights. Well, the North Carolina Dental Board uh, sent cease and desist letters to teeth whiteners saying, you have to stop this. Now, Garrett, who's on the dental board? And who do you think charges more for teeth whitening, dentists or mall teeth whiteners? Dentists charge way more. Uh, so dentists were sending out these letters saying, you can't do this, cease and desist. And again, this is dentists. And yes, Garrett was correct. It's six licensed dentists, one licensed dental hygienist, and one member of the public. I'm not sure what member of the public is going out there wanting to be on the dental licensing board. But, uh, but no, so seven of the people are dental professionals, already licensed dental professionals. Well, um, oop, no one skip ahead. So what happened in this case was not that somebody, these uh, teeth whiteners did not sue and say my constitutional rights are being violated. Um, the Federal Trade Commission came after the dental board and said, you guys are, this is uh, anti-competitive behavior. You can't do this. You can't send out these cease and desist letters under color of law just telling your competitors to stop, right? Which is strange because that seems like what licensee boards do, I mean. But anyways, uh, this is what the Supreme Court of the United States, when it made it up there, said earlier this year. When a controlling number of the decision makers on a state licensing board are active participants in the occupation the board regulates, which by the way is every licensing board, uh, the board can invoke state action immunity only if it is subject to active supervision by the state. And I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole in this particular case because it's a different subject matter, but they were tr the board was trying to say, we're not being anti-competitive, we're just being the government. We're just regulating, you know, this is what we do. We're a licensing board. We regulate people who illegally try to be dentists. Interestingly enough, the conservatives on the court, Alito, Scalia, and Thomas, the guys who probably, honestly, are more skeptical of licensing, were the ones to say, what are you talking about? This is the government. You're telling these people that they can't act Un act in their private capacity. The dental licensing board is the government. If you don't like that, then you need to change the law. Um, because it is confusing, right? The way the court ruled. So, uh, and funnily enough though, the conservatives, under their ruling, the dental licensing board would have won. So I know that this is, the case goes a little bit down a rabbit hole. The point to take out of this case is that the Supreme Court was willing to look at the dental licensing board in North Carolina and say, all you're doing is looking out for your own interests. That's the main point to take out of this case. Um, the fact, for me at least, the fact that the Supreme Court admitted that, the fact that the federal court admitted that that is what is happening is a big deal. Because that, as far as I know, that doesn't happen very often. Um, and lastly, this is the last case study we're gonna look at. St. Joseph Abbey v. Castile, v. Castile. We're back into the world of occupational licensure cases. So St. Joseph Abbey is a, uh, it's, it's a monastery in Louisiana. I think it's right near New Orleans. And these monks, um, this, this certain group of monks, the way they operate is that they believe they can't take donations, but they believe that they should sustain their monastery through their own craft. And they've done this for thousands and thousands of years. So they build these caskets, and they're really, really well-made caskets. Uh, they sell them for a lot of money. They make money off the caskets, and then the money all goes towards keeping up the monastery, supporting their charities, that kind of stuff. Well, you guys know the story by now. There is a board of funeral directors in Louisiana that did not like this too much. They said this was unlicensed casket sales. Uh, well, there's a group called the Institute for Justice in DC, and they are one of the largest libertarian law firms in the country, libertarian conservative. Uh, and they saw this case and they thought, this is the best case we're gonna find. These facts are ridiculous. Uh, if you look back at the promulgation of the statute, the licensing board was clearly promulgating the statute because they couldn't compete with the monks, so they wanted to use the law to put them out of business. So the attorneys at IJ thought, this is the best case we're going to find. Let's go for it. Remember, the government has to claim a legitimate state interest in order to be able to regulate 
uh, anything under the guise of licensure in this like safety. So let's think about this. You're once you know I'm gonna I'm gonna pass away someday. I'm gonna be gone. I'm gonna be in a casket. Am I that worried about whether I'm safe? I don't think so. Now I do think there's some stuff out there about you know like groundwater running off in cemeteries and stuff like that. So maybe that that exists. But anyway, so uh, Garrett, who do you think wins? The monks won. It's and I, I it's cra I know you would think the government would win. That's the right answer when you know the legal theory. But the monks won. This is in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is down in Louisiana and surrounding states. And what the court said is, this is the only really long quote I'm going to read to you today, but this is my favorite quote of the last 15 years in federal law. And the court said, the great deference due state economic regulation does not demand judicial blindness to the history of a challenged rule or the contest context, misspelling on my part, of its adoption, nor does it require courts to accept nonsensical explanations for the regulation. The deference we owe expresses mighty principles of federalism and judicial roles. The principle we protect from the hand of the state today protects an equally vital core principle, the taking of wealth and handing it to others when it comes not as economic protectionism in service of the public good, but as economic protection of the rule makers' pockets. This flies in the face of the rational basis review that we talked about earlier, where economic liberties are at the bottom of the barrel and you have a massive uphill fight in order to win. Um, there are two circuits now the Fifth and the Sixth Circuit have both ruled this way in this context of casket sales. And again, this is the Institute for Justice. They know what they're doing. They found the most ridiculous set of facts they could, and they attacked it in as many federal circuit courts as they could because they want to set this kind of standard. So um, there is a line of cases now where the courts are saying, yeah, I know, we have to give massive deference to you know, the government on economic regulation, but if it's clear that you're just trying to regulate away your competitors, that's unconstitutional, you can't do that. That's taking from one person and giving to another person under the guise of government. Well, in one circuit, the IJ, these, uh, these attorneys who were going after these Catholic cases, they lost in the 10th circuit. And the court there, you'll see, said that uh, state legislation granting special benefits to an interstate industry do not run afoul of the Equal Protection Clause. What that means in layman's terms is that, remember I said there's legitimate government interests? That if you're regulating licensing, you have to put forth some re legitimate government interest, like safety, welfare, whatever. The Tenth Circuit is saying that economic protectionism of an industry is a legitimate government interest. And therefore, regulating away your competitors is fine, which is the exact opposite of what the Fifth Circuit said. What that is in, in law anywhere, but in federal law at the circuit level, is called a circuit split. That means you've got two federal circuits, so two federal courts of appeal between the Supreme Court and the district courts who have two different sets of law. Um, now, me, Institute for Justice, Goldwater Institute, all of us are trying to get this to the Supreme Court to m force their hand and make them decide. Uh, we tried to do it in the Fish case earlier this year, and they didn't take the bait pun. Uh, but um, but it's eventually it seems like they're going to have to address this um, because this is a clear distinction in the law between two different areas. And as of today, when you go out into the world and you're, uh, you're dealing with licensure issues, it really depends on where you live. I mean, that's the best I can tell you. If, if you're in the Fourth Circuit in North Carolina, you still go with the old federal standard of massive deference. Uh, in the fifth and sixth circuits, it's still massive deference, but there's kind of this, but this is getting ridiculous, you know, this kind of thing. And then in the tenth circuit, Lord help you if you're if you're dealing with licensure, because uh, them keeping you out of an industry is a legitimate government interest. So right now, today, it's a little bit up in the air, um, but if I have my say, hopefully we're gonna um, change that and have the Supreme Court address this issue. Um, this is my shameless plug, and very quickly, if you hear what I'm talking about and you like these kind of issues, um, I mentioned I have a Campbell student working for me right now, and he's doing an awesome job. We had the fantastic Mr. Garrett Daniel working last summer, uh, delivering letters and serving process on defendants, and you can contact us and talk more about what we do.